Go ahead. Hallelujah. Yes. Did you do it, if you have your Bible this morning, turn it to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I don't have enough of a crowd for everybody to get up and leave whenever I get ready to preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in the first verse. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. The last several weeks the Lord has had us on this topic and hasn't let us get off of it and we may stay on it. We may be like the preacher who took over a new church or they voted him in and he preached a message and the next Sunday he preached the same message and the next Sunday he preached the same message and finally the deacon board got concerned and came to him and said, when are you going to preach anything different? He said, whenever you begin to live what the sermon that I've been preaching, maybe we'll move on to something else. Amen. So until we can get this rooted and grounded in us, then maybe this is where we're at for a little while because if we miss this, we miss it all. We find out in what we've been teaching, what we've been learning out of the Word of God, that the elders, those of the Old Testament before the cross, they obtained a good report by faith, just like we do today. Abraham was saved by faith, just like we are today. Noah and his family were saved by grace, just like we are today. They were saved in the Old Testament, looking forward to the cross that was to come. We are saved today in this dispensation, looking back at the cross, and what Jesus did on Calvary. We are learning that we are not justified by our works. That we are not spared from God's wrath because we are good enough. That we are not righteous within our own selves. That righteousness only comes from faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. We've read in every sermon that we've done, we finished it up with this scripture. Galatians, the second chapter, the 16th verse says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In this life, whenever we receive a report card from school or from college, we receive grades because of what we have done, because of our own merit, because of our own knowledge, because of the way that we have done things. God's report card doesn't work like that. Amen. If you think one day you're going to stand before God and boast about what you have done and Him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in, you are sadly mistaken. If you think you will stand before God in your own self-righteousness and be justified in the sight of a holy God, you are sadly mistaken. There is only one means of justification today, and it is not works. There is only one means of justification today, and it is not keeping the law. The only means of justification today is faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Amen. There is no other means of salvation, no other way to be saved. And we talked about Abraham. How that Jesus said Abraham saw his day and he rejoiced in it. And the Pharisees scratched their head and wondered what he was talking about because Jesus wasn't old enough for Abraham to have seen him. But Abraham saw it through the eyes of faith. When him and Isaac walked hand in hand up the mountain toward the altar that was going to be built. And Isaac said, Father, here's the fire. and We've got the wood. And where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Amen. And Abraham said, God, we will provide himself a lamb. Abraham saw through eyes of faith the day of Christ and the great promised one that would come. We learned that Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, whenever they sinned and tried to, tried to cover up their own sin, how did they do it? The Bible says that when they sinned, they made for themselves aprons out of fig leaves. They began to try and fix what they had broke. i got news for you. You cannot fix what you had broke. You cannot fix what is broken. Only the blood of Jesus can fix what is broken. And when God comes, He finds them doing what, Brother Tyler? Hiding in the garden. And if you'll read that, you'll find out in the third chapter of the book of Genesis that God 
would clothe them with animal skins. And where did he get those animal skins? From sacrificed animals. The first offering for sin was a blood offering. And since that time, God has always required death for sin. God has always required a sin offering, a blood sacrifice. And all of those that we see in the Old Testament point to one thing, the cross of Calvary and what Jesus did there. We learn from the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis that Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, built altars. And in doing so, Abel brought a blood sacrifice. And he offered it before the Lord and he was accepted. His offering was accepted. But then Cain, he offers on his altar something that he grew himself. The work of his own hand. He stands before God in essence saying, I don't need the blood. What I've done is good enough. And the Bible says that Cain's sacrifice is rejected. Say, what in the world does that have to do with us today because we find ourselves in that place today in the year that we live in. So many today think that what they do is good enough. Amen. So many today think they are holy because they're living right, because they're doing good things, because they're doing good deeds, because they fed people that are hungry, they clothe those that were naked. So many today believing in their own righteousness and none of that will amount to anything. Why did Adam and Eve hide? They didn't hide until the presence of God showed up. They hid because in the presence of God their fig leaves was not good enough. I got news for you. When we stand before an all-holy and an all-righteous God, our self-righteousness, our works and our deeds will not be good enough. They will fade in comparison to the holy God that we stand before. Last week we talked about the blood that the children of Israel took and put on the doorpost of the mantles. And how that, the, that when death passed through, He didn't say, whenever I see your good works, whenever I see how good you are, whenever I see what a good person you are, whenever I see how religious you are, whenever I see your church attendance and your good deeds and your work and your keeping of the law. No, He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's only one thing that causes God's judgment to be deterred. There's only one thing that cause, causes God's judgment not to fall on you. And that is the fact that you're covered in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Faith in Jesus Christ. So we've learned all of that over the past few weeks. And we see time and time again types and shadows in the Old Testament of the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that was to come, the promised one. And today, for just a minute or two, we continue along those same lines, but this time we talk about a baby born and laid in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Because you see, before there was a cross, there was a manger. Before there was a man that John the Baptist would look and see coming and say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Before there was a man, there was a baby. Amen. And that same baby is prophesied of in the Old Testament the same way that the sacrifice was prophesied of. The same way that the Old Testament shows us that a sacrifice is coming, it also tells us of a miraculous birth that would be like none the world had ever known before or since. Amen. 700 years before Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem on that night, the prophet Isaiah would say, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Hallelujah. He would say in two chapters after that, the prophet Isaiah would say, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this night, that, it, that, that hap this, this event that happened that night in Bethlehem, whenever Joseph and Mary went to be taxed into the city of Bethlehem, and they could find no room at the inn, and they found a place in a stable, and the babe was born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. That didn't just happen. Oh, you know, sometimes in this in, in our day and age, people are... They're pregnant and they're going to have a baby and the doctor will say, well, it's going to be due this day. Well, it might and it might not. It might decide to come early. It might decide to come late. Amen. This birth was right on time. 
This had been prophesied since the book of Genesis. Whenever the, God Himself would prophesy of the woman's seed that would come and bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise His heel. Speaking of the suffering of the cross of Christ and the defeat of the kingdom of darkness. This birth would not just happen. This birth would be prophesied. And the enemy knew it all too well. When that baby cried out that night in Bethlehem, don't you, don't you know that it shook the very foundations of the kingdom of darkness because that seed that had been prophesied of since the beginning there in the book of Genesis all down through the ages of the prophets now, that baby was living and breathing and that seed that had been promised was now God made flesh and was dwelling among men. Genesis 3 and 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God prophesies it through the prophets. God prophesies it Himself. Turn with me to the book of Luke, the first chapter this morning. There's a lot of events that take place concerning the birth of Christ that had never happened before. Have never happened since. If you don't think God knows how to put on the dog, Amen. you need to read about the birth of Christ. This wasn't an event like any other had ever taken place before. There had been babies born by the millions. But not like this baby. His shoulders would carry the sins of the world. His hands pierced with spikes. The blood that flowed through those little veins would flow in sacrifice. We haven't left our subject this morning. We're still talking about faith in Christ. God would send the angel of the Lord to talk to Mary and to talk to Joseph and to let them know what was taking place. The Bible says in Luke, the first chapter, the 26th verse, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee called, named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. You see what, what Isaiah had prophesied 700 years before? We now see taking place in the book of Luke in the New Testament. And he shall be great and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which, thou, which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. That was John the Baptist. And this is the sixth month with her who, is, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed. If you go to Matthew, the first chapter, you'll find the angel of the Lord, the same angel going to Joseph. Matthew 1 and 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, the angel had already been to Mary. The Holy Ghost has already overshadowed her. And now this virgin that Isaiah prophesied of is now with child. And Joseph, knowing this, being a just man, not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately because Joseph still hadn't accepted the fact that this has happened and this was a thing that God had done. Think about it for a minute. Suppose you're a spouse. Suppose you're engaged to somebody and they came to you and told you they didn't have a baby but they've never been with a man. Amen. Amen. 
But God's going to fix that because He's going to send the angel of the Lord to talk to Joseph too. Joseph's thinking about putting her away, but the Bible says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And, he shall, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet who Isaiah. We just read that, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. For the first time in the history of God's creation, we find in Luke, the second chapter, that God would disperse a heavenly host. He didn't just send one angel to tell the shepherds. But He sent a heavenly host. Search your Bible and find that anywhere else besides this place. He sends a heavenly host to a bunch of old filthy, stinky shepherds out on the hillsides just outside of Bethlehem to announce the birth of His Son. To announce, because see, this has been a long time coming. This is not just something that God thought, well, you know, I'm not doing anything tonight. I think I'll take I'll let all this happen in Bethlehem. No, this has been on God's calendar for some time. All the way back, this had been a part of the plan of God. And now, the night that it's going to happen, there's going to be big doings in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. The angels said, oh, you mean this is it? Hey, listen, God's people had heard throughout all of the ages that had been passed down from mama to baby, from that baby to their babies, from those babies to those babies. There must, there's a Messiah coming. There's a promise coming. Oh, my, 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 my. I've heard that a king might come, but up till now, there hasn't been one. But there's a new kid in town. Amen? Hallelujah. And it wasn't just enough for God to whisper it to some shepherds. No, He lights up the heavens and sends a heavenly host to bring them good tidings and great joy and let them know that to them this day in the city of David, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born. Luke, the second chapter says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was made first when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now you might think, well, that's good enough. The angel of the Lord came and told, talked to Mary. The angel of the Lord came in a dream and talked to Joseph. And now the angel of the Lord comes to the shepherds that are out on the hillside. And the angel of the Lord said unto them, in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign, and, and this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And you'd think that might be good enough, but God goes a step farther. Verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, from them unto heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. God would send the angel of the Lord to Mary. He would send the angel of the Lord to Joseph. He would send the angel of the Lord to the shepherds. And not just that, Brother Isaac. The heavens would light up and a heavenly host would shout the praises of God that Jesus Christ was born. 
There's a pretty big celebration that first Christmas night. Can't find Santa Claus or Rudolph in it. Because it was all about Jesus. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary, it was all about Jesus. When the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream, it was all about Jesus. When the angel of the Lord and the heavenly host came to the shepherds out there on the hillside, it was all about Jesus. The focus has been turned quite a bit since then because now so many, it's all about grab it and nab it and what I get and sitting on an old man's knee. But it should still all be about Jesus because without Him, there would be no Christmas. Oh, man probably would have created some kind of a mess to have, but it wouldn't have been a celebration of the birth of the Son of God. So God's making big, exciting things happen on this night. I'm closing, but you know what else He did? He would create a star. Amen. This was not a star that had been there before. These wise men would have noticed it. They followed this star from the east, a two-year journey. I know most of the time in our manger scenes, the wise men are standing there with the shepherds, but that ain't how it happened. Took them two years to get there. Yeah. You're talking about a journey. Mm -hmm. And when they stand before Herod, they say, we have seen his star in the east. Yes. God created a star for Jesus, his birth that night. He created a special star in the heavens to signify the birth, the, the uh, fulfillment of the promised seed that would come forth. And this wasn't, even if it had just been a star, you know, God said, well, I'm going to make a star I'm going to hang it there. That would be a, 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 a memorial of my son. But this star moved. This star led the wise men like the cloud by day and the far by night led Moses in the wilderness. The Bible says the wise men followed the star and the star went and it came to a stop over where the young child was at. God made a big deal out of this. Because all throughout the ages of time, he had prophesied, it's coming. Yep. Hang on, it's coming. Sister Carolyn talking about, you know, hold on till tomorrow because your answer may come. Sometimes we think it's a long time because we have to wait a few days or we have to wait a few months. Mm -hmm. God's people, mankind, had been waiting for years and years Amen. and years and years. Some of them had said, well, he's not coming. The old men, Isaiah didn't know what he was talking about. Oh, Isaiah must have been talking about this here because the other never happened. So it must have, you know, he must have been talking about this. Now Isaiah knew what he's talking about. God knew what he was talking about. And now, see, God's timing is not our timing. Amen. There's always something better when he doesn't come today. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. So he creates a star. In Matthew, the second chapter, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to read a little bit of that. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And if you drop down to verse 9, we'll skip Herod's lies. Herod said, oh, I want to worship him too. When you find where he's at, come tell me so I can worship him. Yes, or you can cut his throat. Because Herod didn't want no talk of no other king. And he had heard that a king might come. You don't think Herod took it serious? He took it serious enough that when he got mad, when the, when the wise men didn't come back and tell him, that he said, okay, you go kill every two-year-old and under. Amen. He took it serious enough. But the wise men, verse 9 says, when they heard the king, when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. It moved till it came and stood over where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One more man I want to tell you about. His name was Simeon. 
This was an old man that was in the temple. And the Bible says in Luke, the second chapter, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now think about that. There's a man in the temple and he's waiting to see the Christ that has been promised. No doubt there had been countless babies that had been brought in there for dedication. No doubt there were times that Simeon thought, maybe this one's it. Now he's old. And he would go up and he would look into the face of the child and he would, no, that's not the child. I don't know how many years he had done I don't know how many babies he looked at. But that was not it. That was not it. That was not it. And this day probably was like any other day for Simeon. There he was, waiting in the temple. But this day would be different. This day Mary and Joseph would show up. It was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he, he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Out of all the little babies he'd seen before, now he's holding him in his arms and he said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The way in a manger came down to mankind. The promised seed that we've been talking about, the one who would be the sacrifice that all of the temple furniture and all the temple sacrifices and all the altars of the Old Testament and all the blood shed by the animals before the cross, that child now would become a man and would fulfill what God, what the Father had sent him to fulfill. He would hang between heaven and earth and say it is finished. Amen. And he would give up the ghost and the temple veil would be rent in twain from top to bottom, giving man access to God once again. That is where our faith must be today. The shed blood of Jesus Christ. I know there are days that you feel better about yourself. There are days, Mom, that you don't throw a fit, you don't lose your temper, you go to bed feeling like you're a pretty good old girl. Then there are days that you mess up. Amen. The days that you mess up don't make you any less saved than the days that you lived good. Because you ain't saved because you lived good. You're saved because of your faith in Jesus Christ. There are days I think, well, I'm a pretty good old guy. And there are days that I think, God, why haven't you already cut me off? Amen. Because of His grace and because my faith is not in how good I am, but how good He is. My faith is not in what I can do, Brother Tyler, but what He has done on the cross of Calvary. The elders obtained a good report by faith in Jesus, the promised seed to come. Today we obtain a good report by faith in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. No other way to do it. You might think, well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do this. He's already done it. We just have to rest in that and put our faith in that. Trust in Him, not our... Own words. Our faith must be placed in Him. It's not Jesus' finished work plus what I can do. It's His work plus nothing. Only way that we're going to make it is our faith in Him. All right, Brother Isaac, come running, son, and bring us your scripture this morning.